I'd like to show you the purport which is there in relation to this verse, text number 8, which comes up in the light of the Bhagavad. Right? I'll read the text again. As it's, can you see my screen? Are you able to see my... Yes, Maharaj, we are able to see. Okay, I, I'm reading from the, this text. This is the light of the Bhagavad, and it's a, equivalent to text. Oh, you're not able to see the light of the Bhagavad, the other book? No. Hmm. <laughs> Maharaj, you have to stop this share and then go to that book and share again. Oh, okay. So that, that will take out the, the Bhagavatam then. So I have to, what, stop, stop this share? Stop yes, this share, Maharaj. And then, then put the other book in. Huh? And put the other book and then screen share again. When I'm, again, reshare and select the other book. Okay. Now you can see it, the light of the Bhagwan. Yes, we see that. Mm. Okay, so the purport, are, are the verses here, they, they don't do it by verses, it's just the, the whole the presentation of that script. The evening in the rainy season is dark all around. There is no sign of the twinkling stars on the horizon or the pleasing moon. They are covered by clouds and the insignificant glowworms become prominent in the absence of the luminaries in the open sky. So I wanted to bring some of the points. I think it's good for you to hear them. I've marked them up. In Kali Yuga, there is Dearth, there's a dearth of proper guidance. One may take guidance in the evening from the stars and moon, but in the rainy season, the light of guidance comes from insignificant glowworms. The real light in life is in the Vedic knowledge. And then Prabhupada this is Prabhupada, actually, this is Prabhupada's writing. In the godless civilization of the age of quarrel, there are countless religious societies uh, them trying to ban they need editing, trying to banish God from religion. Glowworms want to be prominent in the absence of the sun and the stars. And these small groups following various religious conceptions are like glowworms trying to be prominent in the eyes of the ignorant mass of people. And then here, in the present age of quarrel, the, the, the chain has been broken, the disciplic succession has been broken here and there. And thus the Vedas is now in... in interpreted by unauthorized men who have no realization. The so-called followers of the Vedas deny the existence of God, as in the darkness of a cloudy evening, the glowworms deny the existence of the moon and the stars. So, <laughs> Prabhupada, this is, in 1961, Prabhupada wrote like this, so how much worse the situation is today? <laughs> so the, the particular problem being that Kali Yuga, there's a, a dearth. Now, uh, there, the, there's no proper guidance. This is the problem, the dearth of proper guidance. There's so many other people, unqualified people want to guide. So there's a real need for people to come forward and to preach the actual knowledge, the real mission of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So this is Kali Yuga. <laughs> okay. So that was Prabhupada's light of the Bhagavad. I'll, I'll go back to the Srimad Bhagavatam. Oh, I should close this, right? Okay, so yes. we're... We are skin Bhagavatam. 
Krishna Lila, text 9, okay. So Bhagavatam, text number 9, the frogs who had all along been lying silent suddenly begin croaking when they heard the rumbling of the rain clouds. In the same way that Brahmana students who perform their morning duties in silence begin reciting, <coughs> begin reciting their lessons when called by their teacher. <coughs> Excuse me. So we know in the ashrams, you have to wake up people in the morning and get them up to Mongol Arti. And you know, usually in, in the temples, we have someone go around with a bell. It depends where you are exactly, of course. But somebody's there to wake up everyone in the ashram, get people up in the morning. Prabhupada said, Everyone should be up by four o'clock in the morning. This was Prabhupada's standard. He used to write letters to devotees. Devotees had gone off to open centers somewhere and Prabhupada would tell them, make sure you get up at four o'clock by four o'clock in the morning. So four o'clock is not early actually. Four o'clock is the standard time. Sometimes when I'm traveling, I, sometimes I would stay in a Buddhist temple and in the Buddhist temple everyone gets up by four o'clock in the morning and they also ring a bell. They have a big bell, a big bell, so it makes it boom, boom, like that, you know, and all the monks will get up and they'll take their bath and begin their meditation. So here also Prabhupada explains in relation to the frogs who begin chanting, they begin their croaking. You know how the Prabhupada was expert in croaking, the croaking of frogs. He'd heard it so much. So uh, the frogs begin to croak and of course that's bringing the snake of death. But here it's a little different. Here it's described that the, the, as the frogs begin croaking when they hear the thunder and they know there's going to be some rain. The students in the same way, when they hear the, 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 the cries of the teachers, then they wake up and they begin to do their work. They begin to chant the Vedic mantras. It's written here, everyone is sleeping in the darkness of Kali Yuga, but when there is a great Acharya, by his calling only, Everyone takes to the study of the Vedas to acquire actual knowledge. So, we actually saw Srila Prabhupada, great, and in the time also before Srila Prabhupada, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, and before that, great devotees like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and all of his associates, how they got the whole world, they, they brought Krishna consciousness to life by their preaching and the holy name was chanted everywhere. People became very much Krishna conscious. So this should be the mood. We need great devotees, great acharyas. And all the devotees should be like an acharya, calling everyone to take up the study of the Vedas and actually acquire knowledge. And we can see now Bhagavad Gita becoming more and more prominent. To give you some examples, you know, Malaysia. Malaysia, there's a, a South Indian population there. Most of the people who are Hindu there are South Indian, Tamils. So Tamil people, when, when the devote Krishna consciousness movement first came there, we, uh, the Tamil people, they have their own prayers, you know, they, they're mostly worshippers of Kartikeya. Or the Murga, they worship Murga, and so they they they, uh, they don't chant prayers to Krishna. They didn't know the Bhagavad Gita hardly at all. It wasn't known at all hardly. There was only a few North Indian Gujarati people who knew Bhagavad Gita, but the South Indian people practically none of them knew. They were all just learning prayers to Murga. Or Durga, or Ganesh, they didn't know. 
Bhagavad Gita at all about Lord Krishna. But since our Krishna consciousness movement has come there, and because of our devotees distributing books and doing so many programs, more and more people are learning the Bhagavad Gita and they're appreciating how it's a, so much knowledge, so much wisdom is there, practical knowledge which is useful in their daily life. So that was one example. Another place where I saw the Bhagavad Gita become more popular was in a country called, a small country, Taiwan. Taiwan is a, you know, it's a really Chinese island, all Chinese people there. But uh, when we first went there, nobody really knew Bhagavad Gita. And even we go to the yoga studio and yoga teachers, they didn't know the Bhagavad Gita. But over the years, now, more and more editions of Bhagavad Gita have come on the market. Huh? Why are we seeing all of these editions of Bhagavad Gita? People have seen our Bhagavad Gita, and they also, they want to write their editions. That's the problem. That they come up, with, they don't write Bhagavad Gita as it is. They write their own interpretation of Bhagavad Gita. But it's nice that people, at least, they become more aware of the Bhagavad Gita. If there was only our Bhagavad Gita, it would be better. Problem is, so many other Bhagavad Gitas now. People are reading all these other Bhagavad Gitas, so they get the wrong direction. But we do see the Bhagavad Gita becoming more and more popular. And also, Sankirtan. Now, in, 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 for example, in USA, in the New York, New York State, upper region of New York State, that means above New York City, upstate New York, they have a region called the Bhajan Belt. The Bhajan Belt is the place where there's so many people doing bhajan and kirtan and singing devotional songs. It's become a fashion there. You know, just like in the past there were things like folk singing and pop music and rock. Now it's bhajan. People are into bhajan and it's really popular. It's a whole belt, a whole, whole spread of it going on in different towns and small places. People coming together and doing bhajan and having kirtans. So this is this is going on. This is this is the effect of Lord Chaitanya's movement spreading around the world. It's happening, and it's not only just there. That's only just some place. It's, there's so many other places where it's also going on. You can go to Australia. You'll see there's a lot of people there, and you go to Europe, for example, little country Switzerland. There's so many groups of devotees around it around the country there who are all engaged in their own different practices of devotional service. So this is due to the acharyas, to people like Srila Prabhupada who he instructed us to loudly, loudly chant the holy name, right? Sometimes people, one man and I was doing life membership again, one man said, oh, you people always make so much noise with everything you do, you know. He said, you always do things, you get so How Prabhupada told us to do it. He said, he said, I cannot think small. He said, I have to think big. And he encouraged us to do big. Don't think small. So this is uh, some points. We want to think about. We'll go ahead, text number 10. With the advent of the rainy season, the insignificant streams which had become dry began to swell and then swayed or strayed from their proper courses, like the body, property, and money of a man controlled by the urge of his senses. So this is in relation to uh, a man who may perform austerities to get property and to get fulfill his material desires, but as he gets it, he just wastes it, he squanders it, he doesn't use it properly, he doesn't make proper use of it. At the end of the section here, in text number 10, it's written, in our materialistic way of life, 
which is just like a desert. We are hankering after an ocean of happiness, but in the form of society, friends and mundane love. We are getting no more than a drop of water. Our satisfaction is never achieved as the small riv rivulets, lakes and ponds are never filled with water in the dry season. So they quote in that purport there about the happiness from material life is just like a drop of water in the desert. So the point is there's no real happiness in the desert. We don't want to go looking for water in the desert. We want to find the real place where there's happiness. And that, of course, is in the spiritual world. That is in our relationship with Lord Krishna and doing bhakti yoga, devotional service. But people forget this. They, be, they, be, they become so infatuated by the material energy that they're thinking the family and the, the bodily beauty and the children and the home and the money, that this is their happiness. But these things are all ephemeral, they're all temporary, they're, they have no such, they're not going to maintain for long. They will be there for some time, but not forever. So we're, we're, we're encouraged to remember the reality. What is the actual situation? That these things are very temporary. And here, they're compared to the water, which is in little ponds and lakes, which dries up in course of time. I see here in Mayapur, they have land around here where we're living, and the land, when it rained, oh, it filled up with water. But after a couple of months, it's all dry again. And so typically, it's, it's very common in, these, in this agricultural region here in Mayapur, around the Ganga Basin, the land is low, and the land may be floody, but then it floods it and then it dries up. It doesn't stay forever. Text number 11, another example is given. The newly grown grass made the earth emerald green. The Indragopa insects added a reddish hue and white mushrooms added further colour and circles of shade. Thus the earth appeared like a person who had suddenly become rich. <coughs> so th this is a... This, this example shows us the colour, the beauty of Vrindavan, the colourful, very colourful. Everything is emerald green, it's all green because heavy rain, so everywhere is green and fresh looking. And then there's these red insects, the Indra Gopa, red, so red and green. And then you've got these white mushroom stalks. So the white mushrooms, and Sridhar Swami, <laughs> Is it here? Sridhar Swami, and there's a quote, oh yeah, Sridhar Swami compares, it says, it's just like a king, the opulence of the king. He has his army, he has his whole palace, he has all the, the, the entourage. So he said it's just like that. This, the opulence, the colour, very attractive, red and white and green. Going ahead, text number 12. With their wealth of grains, the fields give joy to the farmers. But those fields created remorse, remorse in the hearts of those who were too proud to engage in farming and who failed to understand how everything is under the control of the Supreme.
okay, with the wealth of grains, because of the rain. So rain is, of course, we like rain. If you're a farmer, at least, you, you like rain. Of course, not too much, <laughs> but it's important to be able to grow crops. You have to have rain, then you can grow more grains. Um, that's good. Mentioned here, uh, although they certainly, and people don't, <laughs> talking about the materialistic people, they don't like rain. If you live in the city, you think, oh, it's raining, oh no. You live in the city, we don't like it. But for the people in the countryside, rain is good because it's a chance to nourish the crops. And uh, the materialistic people, they do not appreciate that with the rain, the Supreme Lord is feeding not only human beings, but also plants, animals, and the earth itself. So the Lord is doing his duty. He arrange, arranges the, the rain. Of course, he has to be satisfied with yagya to get rain. We know from the Bhagavad Gita, rain is born of yagya. Yagna is born of prescribed duty. So when, when there's a good rain, the, the earth is happy and all the animals also, they get more food to eat, the grass grows better. So this verse is uh, glorifying the farmers. Srila Prabhupada used to say that farming is the most pious profession. They're simply depending on nature, depending on the, the will of the Lord to produce the food, to do their farming, to grow their crops. They have to depend on nature. And whose nature is it? Of course, the Supreme Lord is controlling nature. So farming is a very pious profession. Other people working in the cities, industrial people and capitalists and so on, they're not very pious. But farmers are generally pious people. So in his life of the Bhagavad, Prabhupada writes extensively about this, about the farmers and how they're really glorified, working, producing the grains for the people. Here in this uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, Ridayananda Maharaj writes about the American situation in the USA, what happens and how the government, they don't encourage the farmers at all. And they, sometimes even when the farmers grow something, it will all be thrown away. Oh, you've got too much of that. The price will be, it will ruin the price. We have to throw it in the ocean. And they will throw the food into the ocean rather than give it to people who could, who could eat it. So, a God-conscious government will provide abundance and happiness for all. That's, that's certainly an important point. We, we need to have the good government. We need to have, and to get the good government, people have to be good themselves, because it's the people who elect the government. We have these democratic situations, so the people are responsible for electing the government. But the, because the people themselves are not very good, so they get governments who are also not very good. We can't really blame everyone else. I'll just go to the length of the Bhagavad and we'll have a look at that statement there to see what Prabhupada says. Oh, what happened? You can see it, like the Bhagavad? Yes, Maharaj, we see it. Okay. Oh. 
Okay, here we are. Yeah, from the light of the Bhagwat Prabhupada said, agriculture is the noblest profession. It makes society happy, wealthy, healthy, honest, and spiritually advanced for a better life after death. You can see Prabhupada really glorifying the farmers, and, and properly so. And then Prabhupada goes on to talk about Lord Krishna, how Lord Krishna, he took birth in the Vaishya family as the son of Nanda Maharaj. He, he said, by his personal example, Lord Krishna wanted to teach us the value of protecting cows. And Balaram, of course, he carries the plow, so Lord Balaram, he's the one teaching us agriculture, and Lord Krishna, he plays a flute, so he's with the cows. But from Krishna and Balaram, we see the importance of these two things, agriculture and cow protection. And then Prabhupada talks about trading and how Vaishyas also, of course, they do trading. So Prabhupada explains here, he said, trading means it's meant for transporting surplus produce to places where the produce is scanty. But when traders become too greedy and materialistic, they take to large-scale large -scale commerce and industry and allure the poor agriculturalist to unsanitary industrial towns with a false hope of earning more money. The industrialist and the capitalist do not want the farmer to remain at home satisfied with his agricultural produce. Isn't this true? I certainly, I, I see this in India, they tell me some, some places in India, they want to grow rice, they have no people to plant the rice. Where are all the people? They all went to work in the factories. And similarly in China, it's the same in China. You know, China is also actually like India. It's really a, a, a rural-based uh, society, although now it's become so industrialized. But they have so much land. China is such a big, huge area, so much land. But you go into the villages and the villages are empty. Only the old people are there and the children. And all the other people, the adults, they've all gone to the factories to work. Why? Get money, make money. So this is what they wanted. This is what the capitalists want to do. And they, that in this way, they can exploit more the farmers. Mm. Prabhupada writes, but the real fact is that humanity must depend on agriculture and subsist on agricultural produce. The industrialist, he goes to the villagers to purchase the food grains. He is unable to produce in his factory. Srila Prabhupada was always encouraging the devotees that we have to prepare for the future and he wanted us to have farm projects. And Srila Prabhupada told us, he said, this modern civilization will never succeed. It was, it's doomed to failure. And he encouraged the devotees, he said, you should get your own land and you should grow your own food. You should become self-sufficient. Don't depend on others all the time just to produce your food. So this is very, a very significant point, of course. And, more and more devotees are realizing this. For example, His Holiness Bhakti Raghava Swami is a wonderful example in this regard. Bhakti Raghava Swami, he's really promoting Varnashram, of course, and he's encouraging all his disciples that they should grow their own food. And he tells them, he says, I'll come to your home, but I'm only going to eat what you grow, what you've grown yourself. If you didn't produce it yourself, I don't want it. That's his, his motto. He will only eat what, what the devotees, what his disciples grow. And Prabhupada also liked us to do like that. He, Prabhupada even told us, he said, you know, in the future you may not even be able to get paper. 
you may have to make your own paper. They said, you want to print books, you may have to get your own paper. You should know how to make paper. And Prabhupada, when, we, when he began Mayapur, we had the devotees spinning cloth and making gumptures and making dhotis and saris. It was all going on. Cottage industry, Prabhupada wanted it very much. So this is the glorification of the, the Vaishya. Oh. Where are we? No, this one. Okay, back in the Bhagavatam here. Text number 13. As all creatures of the land and water took advantage of the newly fallen rainwater, their forms became attractive and pleasing. Just as a devotee becomes beautiful by engaging in the service of the Supreme Lord. <laughs> and Prabhupada gives his example, this is quite well known. I think everybody must know this about Prabhupada said devotees look like they came from Vaikuntha. They got tea like on, they shave their heads, they're clean. When they first come, they're dirty and grubby and they don't look good, you know, long hair and everything. But after becoming devotees, they become really devote, really like Vaikuntavasis. So that's mentioned here in the Srimad Bhagavatam also. Sukadeva Goswami predicted this. Going ahead, text 14. Where the rivers joined the ocean, it became agitated, its waves blown about by the wind, just as the mind of an immature yogi becomes agitated because he is still tainted by lust and attached to the objects of sense gratification. So the example is given here. The rivers flowing into the sea and, the, and the, with the wind, big waves come up. And it's just like the mind of the immature yogi who's disturbed by material desires. What should somebody do in that situation? Someone's a yogi, he's an immature yogi, or maybe a neophyte yogi, and he's disturbed by material desires. What would you suggest? such a person, what actions does he need to take? Right? Who's there? Who's the brahmacharis? We've got some brahmacharis in this class, haven't we? Uh, we can engage, we can ask them to engage their senses in Krishna services. Oh, okay. Is that going to help him? He's troubled with sex desire or something? Do you think that's going to be enough for him? His mind will be engaged by engaging in Krishna service. When he chants and he does some physical services. You think he's able to engage his mind? His mind is agitated, sex desire. You think he can really just put his mind so easily into Krishna's service? No, much. He's just negative. What does he need to do? needs more association of Krishna in the form of hearing and chanting, the more he meditates on Krishna. Who is he going to get that association from? From the advanced devotees. Yes, this is the answer. This is what we want to hear. And this is what Prabhupada writes in the light of the Bhagavad. Prabhupada said, he has to take shelter of an advanced devotee. In the association of a strong devotee, the strong devotee can immediately capture his mind and fix him in Krishna consciousness. Just like sometimes people take sannyas when they're immature, they're not properly, they're not very well prepared, not very qualified, so they can get agitated sometimes. In, in fact, in Srila Prabhupada's time, we know there were many young men who took sannyas and they were sincere initially, but they had difficulties. and. Many went away, many gave up, very few survived. So what they need to do actually is take the shelter of the advanced devotee. They have difficulty, go and 
go and be with Prabhupada, go and travel with, they could go and travel with Prabhupada, or find another senior devotee who is not having that problem and be with him and work with him. Don't be alone, that's a fine. Don't be alone with your mind. You have to take shelter of an advanced devotee, somebody who is fixed in Krishna consciousness. So you take, you take shelter of another senior Vaishnava, and then in the association of another fixed up sannyasi, they can help you to be strong in Krishna consciousness. Okay, we'll go ahead, text number 15. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Sorry Maharaj. No, go ahead. Prabhupada's disciples, when Prabhupada left, where they took shelter? On Prabhupada's books? Yes. There was no, no one who is like senior no. uh, to take care of these young sannyasis. Well, there are. There are senior sannyasis. There are people who took sannyas earlier in the movement, they've had more experience. And their ship, they can give, they give also association. You know, we see the, 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 there were senior sannyasis in Prab, even in Prabhupada's time. Maybe there were not very many years in the movement, but they were very strong and very strict in their principles of Krishna consciousness. So, taking association from them, one could get a lot of benefit, one could get shelter. Although Prabhupada left, even after Prabhupada's departure, or even in Prabhupada's time, some sannyasis were more senior than others. It's not that everybody's the same. Okay. Some sannyasis are, you know, they're, and, and that's understood. And Prabhupada writes in some purports, he talks about, you can accept even some, Somebody may be your own god-brother, but you can accept them as your spiritual master and you can take shelter of them and you can take a, and do service for them and be very benefited by their association. Even though you may be a senior devotee, you may even be a sannyasi yourself, but still you can take shelter of another sannyasi. And with this association of another sannyasi, you can become stronger again Krishna consciousness and protect you from these material desires which may come in the mind. So yes, there are senior devotees, you, you know, there are uh, people who are, you know, in, in just in Prabhupada's time they were senior. They were doing more service, they were more, more fixed and more steady in their Krishna conscious practice. It's, it's not all one. We don't think, oh, I'm, I'm proper disciple, he's proper disciple, what's the difference? No, there is a difference. Right? There's a difference. You have to look at how they do service and how they practice sadhana and how they're engaged. Yeah? You understand, Prabhu? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, text number 15, just as devotees whose minds are absorbed in the personality of Godhead remain peaceful even when attacked by all sorts of dangers, the mountains in the rainy season were not at all disturbed by the repeated striking of the rain-bearing clouds. So, of course, when there's heavy storms, the heavy storms hit the mountains, but the mountains don't get disturbed by it. You know, big mountains, a heavy rainstorm's coming. The rainstorm is just going to clean the, it will clean the mountain. It will wash off the, wash the sides of the mountain. It will clear the dirt from the mountain and make the mountain shine. So the same way, devotees, they may be in some kind of difficulty. They may have some difficult situations. It, here it talks about attack by all sorts of dangers. So devotees, as devotees, we, we do see sometimes we're in these dangerous situations. You go to preach in different places, it's not so easy sometimes. So there are dangers, what do we do? 
Well, we just remember Krishna. So devotees who are like these mountains, they can absorb their mind in Krishna and they remain peaceful. Just like, but not every devotee is able to do it. We just heard the other, the other, the previous text was talking about the immature yogi who gets agitated by lust. But here, other devotees, they're like a big, they're like a strong mountain. They're not affected at all. And they, they, like the mountain becomes more beautiful, in the same way the devotee also is getting more mercy of Krishna. It becomes, it becomes uh, purified, more, more and more advanced. From, uh, it's stated here, similarly, an advanced devotee of the Supreme Lord is not shaken from his devotional program by dis disturbing conditions, which instead cleanse the heart of the dust of attachment to this world. So that's what we want. We want, we want to get rid of the dust, the attachment to this world. We want that. But you have to be to take the risk. It, it's, there's some risk. There's dangers there, sorts of dangers. You go out into the field of preaching. So there are always dangers. You have to be cautious. You have to remember Krishna. And if you're not very strong, then maybe you don't want to take that kind of risk. You shouldn't go out there into this, that dangerous. You have to know what is your capability. What are you able, how much are you able to tolerate? How much can you put up with? If you're not so strong, if you're e easily agitated, sexually disturbed, lusty desire, it's not a good idea. You want to put yourself in a better situation. A safer situation. So we have to know your capability, what you can do, what you can put up with and what you can't. Going ahead, number 16. We give during the rainy season the roads not being cleansed became covered with grass and debris and were thus difficult to make out. These roads were like religious scriptures that brahmanas no longer study and that thus become corrupted and covered over with the passage of time. Have you any experience of this kind of thing? The brahmanas no longer study. They're brahmanas. They don't study. They don't read the scriptures anymore. So it's described to be like roads which are washed out. They're covered with grass and debris. Difficult to see where's the actual road. Do you have any experience of this? Nobody? Maharaj, may I say something? Yeah, please do. Um, in South India, I have observed that there are many uh, so-called Brahmanas and uh, uh, they do not spend time reading scriptures and things like that. And then when we invite them to our house for like doing some ritualistic ceremony, and uh, they would want coffee they, uh, you know, before the program starts and they eat pan and, and when, when they chant all the different mantras, many times they don't even know what it, what it means, you know, it's where they, they don't, they don't study, you know, they just learn some, like a skill, you know, they learn like a skill for, uh, existence, you know? Um, but they expect that kind of respect, you know, I am a Brahmana and if you get my blessing, then everything will be, and people do get uh, blessings, but there is a class of people who are becoming very tired of this kind of people, you know, Yes. they don't respect them anymore. In fact, in, in Tamil Nadu, where I come from originally, many, many temples, 
the government has employed um, uh, people who are not Brahmana by birth, you know, they are um, just like you fill up the position of a bus driver or something, you know, they accept applications and uh, they fill up the post of priest in temple and, and those people, they don't have any exposure to scripture, so it's becoming like a business more or less, you know, you give me money, I give you blessing kind of thing. <laughs> Yes, it's true. I, 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 was, I, I was in uh, the, well, in Malaysia, there was one temple, and the, the priest there was a Christian. <laughs> it was a Hindu temple, but the priest was a Christian. <laughs> I was shocked. So this, this kind of situation comes. And sometimes they say, well, I'm a Kali Yuga Brahmin. Kali Yuga Brahmins, we can do everything, we, we eat everything, we can do everything. You know, if you invite the, the Brahmanas, the Hong Kong Brahmanas, Hong Kong Brahmana that can be like that. They want to drink a lot of alcohol, so intoxication and things. There's a very big problem, what is going on in Kali Yuga? I'll just... Yes? Uh, still some devote, uh, Brahmanas are there, they have studied, they studied Shastras, but they have not come to the conclusion that Supreme Personality of God is Krishna. Okay. Yes. Well, they may, you know, we can accept that, they, they may, maybe they accept the Paramatma, maybe they're meditating on the Paramatma, maybe they worship Lord Vishnu, maybe they're worshipping... Even Lord Shiva, they have their ideas, yeah. But you know, something <laughs> they have some kind of direction. But we're generally tolerant about these things. You know, we have to understand this Kali Yuga, and there are so many different divisions. You know, we can't expect everybody's just going to immediately accept Krishna because the Lord Vishnu has been mentioned so much. Lord Vishnu is there, and Lord Shiva is also temple, his temples are more than Lord Krishna. So here's Prabhupada's writing on this section, and from this verse from the light of the Bhagavad. He said, a covered road is exactly like a brahmana who is not accustomed to studying and practicing the reformatory practices of Vedic injunctions. He becomes covered with the long grasses of illusion. In that condition, forgetful of his constitutional nature, he forgets his position of eternal servitorship to the personality of Godhead. By being deviated by the seasonal overgrowth of long grasses created by Maya, a person identifies himself with illusory productions of nature and succumbs to illusion, forgetting his spiritual life. So this is a situation in Kali Yuga. People fall into that kind of situation. Brahmanas, oh, very difficult. We, we are trying to establish what is actually the real Brahmana. All right, so here we are, text number 17. It's an interesting one, text 17. Though the clouds are the well-wishing friends of all living beings, the lightning fickle in its affinities, move from one group of clouds to another, like lusty women, unfaithful even to virtuous men. Well, sometimes it's the other way around. Here, here it's like this, it's talking about lusty women, unfaithful to virtuous men. Sometimes it's virtuous women and the men are unfaithful. It's not necessarily only like this. Prabhupada, uh, anyway, Sukadeva Goswami's 
generally he's, he's speaking to men. When Sukadeva Goswami was speaking Srimad Bhagavatam, there were no women present. So his audience were men. So he's speaking to men. He's talking that you know, sometimes lusty women are unfaithful even to virtuous men. And Prabhupada com uh, Srila Prabhupada comments, during the rainy season, lightning appears in one group of clouds and then immediately in another group of clouds. So this is phenomena as compared to a lusty woman. She doesn't fix her mind on one man. And so it's a common situation. We see today, you know, that so many people, they marry and remarry and, you know, this, this marriage, oh no, this one not successful, try again, get married again. So this has been going on a lot. It's very common in the world today, becoming more and more common. It becomes so bad that people sometimes, they don't even bother to marry. They just simply live with each other in the name of married life. And you have what's called common law, husband and wife. Right? They're living together without marriage. So Prabhupada's comment on it, it is therefore recommended that a woman desiring to advance in Krishna consciousness peacefully live with a husband and that the couple not separate under any condition. The husband and wife should control sex indulgence, concentrate their minds on Krishna consciousness so their life may be successful. After all, in the material world, a man requires a woman, and a woman requires a man. So when they are combined, they should live peacefully in Krishna consciousness and should not be restless like the lightning flashing from one group of clouds to another. A very uh, powerful example, the lightning flashing from one cloud to another. Of course, these things are, you know, it's easy to say these things, that you should live with this man and not separate. And it, it's very good if you think like that. It's not always so easy for people to apply it. And Prabhupada even saw he had he had his uh, he had a servant, his own Prabhupada's own servant. So he got married, but then after some time it didn't work, and he had to you know, the marriage broke up, and then he got married again, like this, you know. So even people who were very close to Prabhupada, they had difficulties with their marriage. Even when the first marriage, Prabhupada had approved it, and Prabhupada, when the servant got married, Prabhupada gave them both rings. He gave the husband and wife rings. And in the beginning of our movement, Prabhupada would even arrange the marriages for the couples. But he saw that the marriages were not working out, and the couples were separating and divorcing each other. So Prabhupada said, I don't want to be involved anymore with this. You can arrange your own marriages. This happened quite early on in our movement. Prabhupada became so disappointed with the devotees that they couldn't live together. They, they couldn't live together peacefully. They couldn't live together as, house, as, uh, house, as Krishna conscious grihastas and they would divorce and separate and get married and go off with somebody else. So Prabhupada said, I don't want an, any more involvement with your marriages. You people arrange your own marriages. So that's what happened in our Krishna consciousness movement. Of course, that time the devotees in the movement, they were young and they were Westerners and they were not familiar with the culture. It's a little different for people brought up in India. Because at least in India, people have that kind of culture a bit more. That the, the, the marriages are arranged and they will accept it and go on with it and they, they will not think of divorce. But the Western culture is so, so degraded. And now that degradation is also coming also into India also. Any comments? Anyone? 
Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Can I say something? Please do. Uh, recently, when I was talking to my mom, not so like, maybe like a few years ago, a year or two ago, when I was talking to my mom, she commented that the Supreme Court in India has um, said that any affair outside of marriage will not be anymore considered illegal before the wife had the right to even arrest the husband and things like that, you know, or vice versa. But now it's legal to have um, affairs outside of marriage. There will be no consequences. And uh, they can always divorce, you know, the option is there, but nobody can anymore um, make any case if the husband or wife is not faithful, you know, as per Indian law. So the, you mean a man can have more than one wife? He will have legally only one wife, but he will not face any consequences if he is having an affair outside of marriage. Oh. Mm. Before he would be arrested and, and there will be some legal consequence if the wife wants, you know, or the husband for the wife and wife for the husband. There could be legal consequence. It was not accepted as a good practice. Mm -hmm. But now the government has um, sanctioned it as a proper, you know, that, that there will be no consequence for such actions. Oh my goodness. And, and that's true even for women also? Yes. Mm. Yeah, and just see how Kali Yuga is penetrating and the influence of the age of Kali, so much degradation. The people can do what they want without any consequence. Of course, that's in the eyes of the government. In the eyes of the government, they're not going to be punished. But according to Shastra, according to scripture, there will be punishment for that. So they, can, they may escape from the laws of the government. Uh, the, the, the laws of the government may accommodate that kind of behavior. But certainly the scriptures don't accommodate that kind of behavior. And they can I make it? Yes. Generally, what we found was that uh, uh, no one is telling people that uh, that even after you divorce, you will just remain as husband and wife. Uh, like uh, it, it is uh, the the marriage is not uh, just a legal affair. The marriage is also a bondage which is uh, made by uh, by some karmic arrangement. And once they are married. Uh, till they die, they have to remain husband and wife, or the husband has to take sannyas. Uh, till the time they have to remain husband and wife. Even if the husband takes sannyas, then wife is considered only as a widow. She is not free from marriage. Uh, but but this is not being properly taught to youngsters, even within the devotee community. So they think that by getting a divorce, marriage gets cancelled. So there is no concept of cancelling a marriage. Which means that the, the consequence, even after divorce, has to be faced by the husband or the wife because they are still married. Uh, divorce is just a paper which has no meaning according to Shastra. So somehow this education is not uh, being given uh, to even within the devotee community. Devotees think that, uh, okay, we can divorce, we can marry again. Uh, but Prabhupada is quite, um, strong. quite strong in uh, in what, in how he writes, uh, he accepts, proper accepts separation uh, when uh, the husband is uh, uh, Naradama or wife is uh, adulterous, then mm. proper accepts separation. Uh, he says that according to Vedic system, they can be separated. Yes. Uh, but uh, but proper doesn't accept remarriage, except uh, especially for women. Uh, proper very strongly writes in one of the purports, uh, saying that. Uh, if a woman remarries, it constitutes uh, prostitution. Prostitution, right. That's right. It's a fact. But in general, but in general nobody speaks about these things now. Uh, nobody wants to uh, upset the apple cart in that sense. Yes. Mm. So that, that lack of training is also another great aspect uh, in, in, uh, in not having proper awareness about 
what constitutes a marriage and uh, what is the sanctity of marriage, etc. Yes, education is very important, you're right. Nowadays we, we do have, like in USA, there's a thing called Grihasta Vision Team, GVT. The GVT, Grihasta Vision Team. And it's a group of uh, very senior devotees who are in family life and they make it a point to tr help people prepare for marriage. Because entering into marriage is a responsibility and it's a commitment and people should be aware of what's happening when they enter. And, and it's unfortunate that a lot of people, particularly in the West, that we, we don't really, we're not really aware of it. We never thought about it. We never, we just thought, you know, my wife, you know, somebody to have a relationship with. And we never really thought about the commitment and the responsibility and the planning which are required. His, Holi His Holiness Jai Pataka Swami prepared a, a questionnaire for couples who are entering into married life. And it's about a hundred questions, you know. And the, the, hus the husband, the, you know, the proposed, the prospective husband and wife, before they get married, they should go through these questions with each other and they should answer these questions together. And in this way, they get a bit better, a much better uh, preparation for married life. Because they have to understand, what does this woman expect? Or what does this man expect? What's going, you know, what, what's the future going to be like? Often we, we don't, they don't even think about that. We enter into family married life without thinking. And that's why pr problems come. So immaturity, lack of preparation, no proper guidance. So these things are the real problems. And we're trying to work against that trying to prepare people and uh, as, as time goes on our movement is having much better success although in the beginning the marriages were not very successful but more recently it's been much better Hare Krishna Maharaj yes Maharaj in the past like uh, even prostitutes also uh, went back to Godhead have they who prostitutes who have engaged in Krishna consciousness, they attain Krishna. Well, well, I don't know about prostitutes, but Putana went back to God, huh? But in the small, small stories, they say like this. Maybe because of that, devotees are, uh, we are licensed, you know. That's why they are not following. <laughs> Even prostitutes can go back to God. The Lord is so merciful. So we are getting legally married. Well, it will, depend, if they, it will depend on their attitude. If they consider themselves very fallen, you know, <laughs> if they're thinking I'm very fallen, I'm very fallen, then, that, then, then probably maybe they can go back to Godhead. But they have, they have to have the right mood to go back to Godhead. It's not they can go back to Godhead thinking I'm a prostitute and I'll be a prostitute in the spiritual world. It's not like that. There are no prostitutes in the spiritual world. That's not going to be there. That profession is not there. Right? Like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mood is like that, no? Who is the most fallen one? <laughs> Who will be delivered? Yes, well, that is the mood of all advanced devotees. Naratam Das Lochan Das Thakur, they're all saying, I'm the most fallen. My claim is first. Take me back to Godhead. The people who are actually fallen, they're thinking, yeah. they, don't, they don't always think I'm so fallen. The people who are really fallen, they often don't understand that they're fallen. Um, actually, I just read in the, in first canto when the Lord was coming to Hastinapur, so there were many prostitutes were there, and Prabhupada said uh, he's writing the purport, and they are devotees of the Lord, so they can be devotees of the Lord. Oh yes, they can be devotees. There's no doubt. It's in Dwarka. It's when the Lord came to Dwarka. 
the, yes. the, the, yes, yes, Dwarka. Sorry, the, Dwarka. they all came out to meet him and the, the prostitutes were also there and Prabhupada talks about how prostitutes are there in the society that there's a particular class of men who have to have that kind of uh, cop opportunity or something yes yeah, so they were there they were devotees but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're pure devotees that they're going to go back to Godhead they may be there in Dwarka but I'm, I don't know and they may, of course, they come out and see Lord Krishna, that's very good, it's certainly very beneficial for them. But I don't know if they're going to go straight back to Godhead. Maybe when they get old, maybe they change, you know, and they, become, they give up their bad habits in their old age and become more cultured uh, or take up a different profession. I don't know. Prabhupada doesn't, didn't really explain these things. One, one point I heard recently, one devotee was explaining, he said that in, in Vaikuntha, there's no renunciates. That in Vaikuntha, everyone's a householder. That there, there are no renunciates. There's no question of being a sannyasi or a, a brahmachari, you know. Everyone's a grahasta there in, the, in Vaikuntha. So that's, I thought that was interesting. Huh? You know, in the spiritual world, you're not going to renounce. Maharaj, but in Golok Vrindavan, there are brahmacharis, Gyastas. Really? The cowherd boys are all brahmacharis. <laughs> Who? Cowherd boys. Well, that, they get married. They're young boys, and as they grow up, they get the parents get them married. So they will be always eternally young boys, no, Maharaj? Uh, yeah, if they okay, if they stay eternally young boys, but <laughs> they go they go out with but they're married. They can be married also. The gopis are mostly married, right? We hear they're married. Who did the gopis marry? They marry cowherd boys. Yes. Anyway, you got Madhu Mangal. Madhu Mangal is not married. I don't think he's married. <laughs> Madhu Mangal, Krishna's friend. Okay, but uh, yes, anything, Prabhu? Maharaj, can I say something regarding all this topic? Yes, please do. Uh, Maharaj, uh, now current situation in our Eastern society, uh, I can see that many divorces are taking place. So why this... Uh, uh, divorce was taking place because before getting married they did not check their compatibility, astrological chart. That's why uh, this uh, divorce take place in hearts. Well, the astro astrology more. is not 100%. The astrology is some indication but it's not 100%. Of course, it's it's, 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 in Bhagavata Maharaj. Yeah, yeah, it's, Bhagavata. it's it's a guide. It's a guide, but it's not one hundred percent. I've seen couples with very good astrology compatibility, but the marriage broke down. Yes, Maharaj, I would, I, I would totally agree with you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Rather, I would, I would, I would. To, to this argument, I, I can, if I may add, uh, why don't the astrologers become a party when there is a divorce case? <laughs> the astrologer should also be dragged to the court that he gave this uh, guarantee that the marriage will be 100% successful. And now they are getting divorced. We, the astrologer should be also be dragged to the court to explain why is this happening. Yeah. <laughs> You have to understand the astrologers are not perfect. These are, you know, people who do the astrology, they may not be so perfect. They try to guide, but it's not always 100%. You can't expect it will be 100%. It's a material science. But it's, it, there is some indication, it's certainly helpful if you have a good compatibility chart, it's certainly helpful.
to a good marriage. It's certainly something which you would want to check before marriage, to be sure. Uh, particularly if you, you, you're, you're married, you're expecting to have a child, so you can often see that very easily from the chart, that, oh, it's very good, yeah, yeah you'll have a couple of children without any trouble. And so some people are happy with that. And sometimes you can see in the chart, oh, you'll never have a child. And so that's a big problem for some people. They really want to have a child. But you can see from a chart that, oh, you'll never get a child. No chance. And so these things, uh, there are some indications here. Okay, we will stop then tonight. And we'll meet tomorrow again. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Go back to Vrinda Ki. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.